class, and welcome once again to Eddie's workshop. Um, ongoing uh, sequence of which videos where I talk about the RPG development process and different stages of it. Um, this week, uh, we're going to go into the editing stage. I'm not going to talk about editing directly. Um, I'm not an editor. That's definitely something that you want someone like Dixie Cochran to be able to take care of, but more how editing fits into the development process. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right to it. Uh, those of you who have been watching this, uh, you'll recognize this chart almost immediately. Um, in the past, we've already talked about the design stage, uh, pitches and outlines. Um, we've talked about the production stage, about bread lines in particular, and, and what like the development is happening after that. All of the production stage is meant to get as clean of a manuscript as possible to editing. Um, so when the manuscript goes to the editor, ideally they have as little to do as possible. Um, obviously that's not the case. Um, and uh, before I dig into this, I want to say there's one thing that I see a lot of new developers do or, or say they can do, um, particularly developers who also are editors or have experience with editing, um, which is where they try to do edit their own material. And I highly discourage this practice, it's never possible. Um, because for some reason, uh, the way the, the human brain works, you will see through all of your errors, no matter how hard or rigorously you try to look over them. Um, you're, we'll read the same sentence 16 times and uh, you will still miss that one very obvious type that somebody else will see immediately. Um, yes, Dixie, this, this is, this is, well, it's not your editing episode, it's my editing episode, but yes, we're going to talk about you and the amazing work you do a lot. So enjoy the kudos. Um, so having someone like Dixie being able to come on board and say, oh, hey, you, you missed this thing entirely. If you thought about this, if you noticed this changes from here and there, um, having that fresh pair of eyes is vital. Um, and so having a good relationship with your editor is a really important part of the development process. It is so easy to look through stuff. That being said, I still feel developers should make every good faith effort to attempt to do that. They should, once the manuscript comes back from approval, it is approved. Um, we have uh, what's called a post-editing -devel post development phase where they make one last attempt to try to make things as clean as possible for the editor. And there are two reasons for this. One, we don't want to make the editor's job as, as hard as possible. I mean, you want, we want to make their job easy because on the one hand, it's kind of a jerky thing to do, just dump it on the editor and say, you fix it. You know, that, that's just not, I don't find it to be very professional to, to expect the editor to do basic copy edit work when some of the developers in their scope of doing. Uh, but more importantly, if you clean up as much as possible, the editor will then be able to focus on things that you aren't seeing and you are missing. Um, if you put a bunch of unformatted, unstructured, highly, not even running spell check on it to the editor, they're going to focus on the surface edits and those surface changes, and they may miss more deeper, more substantial, more systemic problems that would otherwise be visible if the copy were actually very clean. Um, so, uh, all that to say is that it seems a lot of, of developers, particularly those who are new to the process, feel like it's just, I have the manuscript, just get over to the editor and they'll take care of it, is not actually a, a good general practice. So, um, what I'm going to show you today is I've shown lots of bits and pieces of Monarchies of Mal. This is uh, the next step of that. I'm going to go through a number of chapters of Monarchies of Mal. Uh, in which uh, uh, Dixie Cochran specifically did the edits for me as a developer. Um, again, partially because um, it's good to show an, an, an example, but I also like to show the work that I'm in, involved with. I don't like showing other people's work. And sometimes um, editing comments can be very um, uh, brusque if necessary. Um, it, may, it may have to sometimes very firmly let a developer know that this is a, a serious problem that needs to be changed. Um, but Monarchies of Mal was actually not a bad book in that respect. Um, uh, luckily, I do pride myself on trying to have relatively clean copy over to editors. Um, and uh, Dixie, while this was 
early on in her in-house work with us, or I think it was right before her in-house work. I'm a little fuzzy on the, the timeline, um, but it was still relatively early in our personal relationship. But she did develop, or sorry, she did edit Pugmire before, so she was familiar with the Pugmire brand, at least. Um, combined with the fact also the monarchy is Mao, even though there was an established book before them, um, it's still a new tabletop game. So also do you see some edits that relate to the art of uh, actually establishing what it's like to figure out the style of a very new game. Um, and Dixie just says it was close to a year before she came on board. So it's still really early on. And the tenor of the comments, you'll see what kind of reflect that early relationship. Um, so if we start with the uh, credits page, um, one thing that Onyx Path does is we have a, um, a credits template. Um, and what this is, it's called credits, and I put that in air quotes, but really it's the credits, it's the back cover text, it's the spine text, it's the credits um, page, it's, it's all, we, generally we call the frontis material. Um, and the back cover as well, and also legal text and whatnot. We just put it all in one document, um, and by having it in a, a particular format, all of our lab people are familiar with this format, so you know exactly what to get from where. Um, as a side note, if you are a developer for Onyx Path and you're watching this, please use this document. Uh, it's very important to make sure that we have all the material there so people like Dixie can actually edit the material before it goes onto the book. Um, we don't want our layout people who aren't necessarily writers trying to transcribe or even write this text. Um, and so this can seem like it's a pretty boring document to start with, um, but it is useful here to kind of show the important things that are you need to think about even at, at this stage of the book, um, particularly the back cover text. This is extremely short, punchy material um, that needs to sell what the, what's cool about this game. Um, it, back cover text is a slightly outdated misnomer. It is literally a text that goes in the back cover for print-on-demand books and for books that we put into the printer for distribution. Um, PDFs don't always have this text, but then otherwise it is the text that goes on the, the website when we sell the book. So it's also our sales text. So having it be relatively short, so it fits in the back of a book, relatively short so it fits in a drive through RPG sales page, these are all good things to have. Um, Onyx Path books generally have a rough structure of, uh, they have a quote at the top here, um, usually about a paragraph of what the actual book is about, um, and then uh, three to five bullet points of here's what you'll find in a book and here's what's cool about this book. So in this case, um, we have uh, the quote from uh, Monarch Trelawney, per uh, Persian Bon Mal. Um, we have a, 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 material, a text here that kind of really is similar to what I wrote for Pugmire, um, but it twisted and tweaked to make sure it fits Monarchy's Mal. Um, and then the highlights here. And I think this is also, personally, I think this is good for the editor because they're seeing this document first. Usually they're going to read that in order. So this is telling them right away, this is what we're expecting this book to look like. So it's very kind of helpful to them to say, oh, okay, now I understand what we're trying to, what kind of tone and feel we're getting out of this book because it's got to be right there on that back cover text. So even though this is one of the last things written usually for a product, it's one of the first things that people looking at a book will want to will read. So making sure this gets done well is good. And so having the editor freshly looking at that is really, really important. Um, and then a minor point here, you can see um, uh, uh, Dixie has changed uh, the capitalization of always after um, a uh, colon. Um, different style guides have slightly different takes on that. Onyx Path does prefer to be capitalized after the colon, so she corrects that for me. I've been working for Onyx Path for over a decade. I've been working with Rich Thomas for even longer, and I still screw this up. I mean, so no one is perfect. You're always going to miss bits and pieces of a style guide. And again, that's why you want to have an editor looking over this stuff and making sure that you're thinking about it. Now we're going to get into uh, the prologue. Um, and this is uh, this was a short piece of fiction uh, that was used to kind of open the book up to get people excited about the material. Um, and we have the first kind of, of comment here from Dixie. Um, uh, I have a sentence here is, like his comrade, the rat was dressed in a long leather coat bleached white. Um, and Dixie added, that was bleached white. And with comment of, or bleached white leather coat. Just kind of giving a couple of examples of how to make this text a little more appropriate and make it flow a little better. Um, uh, a lot of times the editor will do, like Dixie's done here, which is just drop the text right in. And it's like, just edit it. Um, but sometimes if it's like, oh, it could be this or it could be this, then usually they'll leave comments here on the side. Um, as a note, uh, um, 
one of the things is that we, in Onyx Path, we do uh, use Word as our default for this for a cup for some boring technical reasons, but suffice to say, we do need to have Word documents. And so we generally use track changes. Uh, and this is really helpful because it's really hard to see things like, you know, deleting this colon, putting a space here. That's a really hard edit to notice as a developer. If you're just looking in a manuscript, I would not have remembered that that was there. But by track changes, I can see, oh, okay, this is here. Um, and so that, that also this, that was pops out even more. Um, as a, also part of the reason why the track change is good is because I'm not going to always agree with the edit. Or perhaps more commonly in this case, um, I have two different options, so I may want to go to the second option, so I want to, I want to change, straight up change this material. But by having track changes, I can accept or reject those changes. as you And also sometimes um, little things like uh, the editor missed a piece, um, or due to the quirkiness of how uh, Word does track changes, sometimes it's like delete or add a space, and you have to kind of make sure you're putting those back in to make sure that that change is clean. So it's good to review every single edit. Um, and on a good day, it's basically just I'm sitting here clicking, carefully watching, clicking accept a thousand times as I go through the whole manuscript. Yes, 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 no, yes, 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 yes. That, ideally, that's the case. But more often, what's happening is you're doing a little bit of, of tweaking and rewriting as you, you go through. Um, uh, oh, it's a, um, people in the uh, uh, chat are actually already <laughs> discussing uh, different style guides and the like. Um, Dixie corrects me that um, you only capitalize after a colon if the... the after the colon is a complete sentence, um, which is a fair point. Um, and so uh, we also talk a little bit about uh, AP versus Chicago, which I believe, if I'm correct, um, it's a blend of both. Um, uh, this is way down the rabbit hole, but um, White Wolf, uh, class, original White Wolf, uh, set the original style, which Onyx Path inherited uh, because we were writing books in those styles, so we wanted to keep that style. And, and over the years, we've, we've tweaked and modified that style guide. And in fact, over the past year or so, we've actually done some slightly more substantive discussions of revisions to the style guide. Um, but it originally did start with uh, people using uh, AP journalism style. Um, and then over time, as we got more... Uh, academic writers uh, and more fiction writers, um, some of the Chicago stars are bleeding into the style guide. And so it's kind of a hybrid approach to both. It has some its own unique things. It's, it's, a, it's a very strange thing, but it is our house style now. It's, it's established style. It's been established by some reckonings 10 years, by other reckonings over 20. So we have to make sure that everything's following that style. Anyhow, um, I was talking about track changes. Uh, uh, again, it's important to kind of help for a developer to track those and be able to see those. And also it makes it easier to kind of review them. Um, but it is important that the developer do review those because again, just like the developers can make mistakes, editors are gonna make mistakes too. Um, that's part of the gig. Um, and sometimes there's a certain aesthetic choice that developers are trying to do that the editor might not get. And so the developer has to make a different choice on that. Um, another example here is um, I had cults a lowercase, but the, it's cult is reference to cult of laboratory. Um, and at one point early on in the process, I thought it was going to be the, the entire cult was going to be called laboratory. Um, but during the pro, during writing and revision, um, we decided that the formal title was going to be cult of laboratory. But since cult is now part of the title, it really should be capitalized. So good catch on that part. Um, and I'm going to go through a number of these chapters because I want to show you some of the variety of edits. I'm not going to go through every single edit, but I'm going to show you uh, some of the changes here. Like, I'm not going to go over why these commas changed. I don't think that's particularly relevant. Um, but this is uh, another good, it's kind of substantial comment. Um, Dixie highlights uh, this, the, the, the phrase, They consider men to be loyal servants whom their feline ancestors were rewarded with great power and responsibility. Um, and Daisy comments that though I know this is how this is supposed to parse, it reads a little like the servants were rewarded with the power and responsibility as opposed to the ancestors being rewarded with servants, which came with great power and responsibility. So um, it's one of those things that it's technically accurate, but it still reads oddly. Uh, so that did, uh, I did rewrite that section based on uh, her guidance. Um, and then sometimes that's uh, particularly good editors are thinking about is that there are times where the writing might be technically correct, but still not it's best idealized form. And even uh, there are times when the editor may encourage you to break style very slightly because the way it's landed on the page will parse better. For example, um, 
Traditionally, Onyx Path uses American English as default. Um, however, when I am writing uh, dialogue, say, for Irish characters, um, uh, then I'm going to consider spelling and slang that is not American English. So we're intentionally breaking the style, but there's a very specific reason. We're talking about a character who's speaking in a very different kind of cadence and structure. So make sure that's being appropriate. Um, uh, so uh, also, um, track changes helps with things like font changes and style changes, which again can be helpful. Because um, italics in particular um, can be a little fuzzy. Some people really love them. I, I am, used to be very bad about using italics for emphasis. Um, and over the years, I've slowly weaned myself off of that. Instead, tried to change it to where the, the sentence structure emphasizes the word rather than me telling you that's the word that needs emphasis. Um, and then that, therefore, when I do use italics more sparingly, they, they do have more impact because otherwise, if every other word's italicized, it just looks like a bunch of italicized words. Um, particularly in the case of things like uh, Monarchies of Mao, where the title's italicized, that's one more bit of italics. Um, whereas uh, above here, um, you'll see that um, I have theme, mood, and action italicized here. I tend to like to have the first instance of a word where it's close to its definition being italicized. For some reasons, for some books, the structure of the book doesn't allow me for the first actual use of the word. But generally speaking, if I'm defining the word, I want to italicize and emphasize that this is a, a word, a, a lexicon or a piece of vocabulary that's necessary to understand the game we're playing in right now. Uh, so, um, let's go through the next one here. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, as a side note, um, uh, I'm using a PDF version of these Word documents because for some reason my computer will not allow me to stream Word documents. It's very strange. Um, but I found making PDF allows me to save all the, the comments. Um, little things like, you know, uh, I, I, I watched the Game of Thrones uh, by George R. R. Martin. I really meant the entire um, Sword of Ice and Fire series. Um, and so Dixie Crack pointed out, it's like going, do you mean only cite the first in the series? I didn't mean to cite the whole series. So I, I think, I believe that got changed. Um, uh, uh, this was a, a slightly rougher section. Um, so a lot more kind of changing it and getting things cleaned up. Um, uh, you see also, here's a good example of style um, where none of these are technically wrong. Uh, but you'll see that 20-sided uh, die, 10-sided die, 12-sided die are replaced with numerals. Um, generally speaking, we do use spell out uh, numbers at, at a certain point. Um, but in this case, it made more appropriate sense to call to put the numerals by them also because they're shortly followed by the, the die code, the D code. So 20-sided die, D20, by having the numeral there kind of connects those better. So again, little minor stylistic points. Um, uh, um, okay, <laughs> yeah, if you have a good relationship with an editor, um, uh, sometimes you will uh, see positive comments as well. I talked last uh, class about how as a developer it's good to also sometimes point out the positive things in a manuscript as well as the negative things. Um, and editors, it's, ideally they can do this as well. Um, so the adventure in Monarchy's Mouse called All Hail the Rat King. And uh, right before this, I had told uh, Dixie a story about how when I was playtesting the adventure at Midwinter, um, there, was, there was a little kind of gathering of, of tiny mice. And every time someone said the Rat King, the mice in the background would go, the Rat King, and then drink. Um, so uh, she sees the Rat King, and then she... In the comments, it goes, the Rat King! And it's kind of an inside joke between me and his developer. It was, it's a nice touch because sometimes reading these comments can be, you know, a little... It's like, oh, uh, you know, it's like, oh I can't believe I screwed it up. You know, you can get emotionally wound up by, by red lines. I know sometimes I still do. I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and I still sometimes kind of, you know, get worried about red lines or, or editorial comments. So uh, uh, being able to have these little bits of humor in here and I was pointing out, oh, this is really cool and really nice, um, does help to kind of go, okay, cool, the editor's really enjoying and liking this. Um, not every editor does that. Some editors really prefer to just keep with the work and that's fine, it's not a requirement. But even when you're developing a good relationship with an editor, you, you will probably start seeing more of those kind of fun comments. And it, it, makes, it makes the whole process a little easier. Um, so chapter one, this is another um, uh, uh, 
sometimes I call this uh, pseudo prose, um, but basically this is an in-character document that's meant to be read as a specific game function. In this case, it's our background chapter, um, but the background chapter is written in character. Um, we sometimes call these artifacts, uh, sometimes like pseudo prose. Um, it doesn't really have a common name, but in, what's basically happening here is that this is um, meant to be written by several, one particular character in the quartos and the other characters are interjecting through it. So there's a lot of character voice that needs to be blended with the actual style here. And if I remember correctly, this is pretty light, but there was one comment I wanted to kind of point out here. Oh, um, uh, uh, side note, I talked about this during the um, redlining phase, but uh, Onyx Path at least does use um, what we call in-house comments, uh, which is basically a different style uh, that puts everything uh, indented with a all caps block lettering. Um, and these are notes to keep inside the manuscript. Um, one thing that's, these are different from word comments because to me at least, um, word comments are meant to be tran transitory. Uh, they're used to help you get from one stage of a project to the next stage of a project. Um, so in this case, all of these comments that Dixie is making on, on uh, Monarchy's Mao, I'm going to eventually delete or resolve all of them before I hand on to the next phase. Um, when we do approvals phase, I ideally want to have all the comments resolved so that way we can make new comments for the approval phase. And then the developer will resolve all those comments as they go through. But if I'm in the process of getting the manuscript ready for approval and there's a note that I need to make sure that um, the layout person needs to do, uh, I will put that in in-house. Uh, sometimes when in the middle of writing something, I'll put an editor note in in-house saying, hey, this is spelled unintentionally for a reason or there's a reason why this thing is, is doing what it's doing. So you um, mostly realize in-house thing. Usually they are for layout people because they come at the end of the process. Um, but sometimes I do also put editorial comments in there. Um, there was a reason why I picked this chapter. Uh, here we go. Um, uh, so this is where I, I contradict what I just said. Um, but in this case, um, this note to the editor wasn't something that was persistent rather than this was, um, as I was getting it ready for editing, I, I had a question about it. So I put a note in here. Um, if you know who the editor is going to be, you can address it directly to them. Um, uh, in this case, as Dixie reminded me, this was before she was in-house, so I would have given this to Rose, who then gave it to someone else. So I didn't know which editor was actually getting this, so it kind of a more neutral note to editor. Um, and then where I've worked at is like different programmer editors have that, with this capsulation after a colon. This is exactly the thing we were talking about earlier. I wasn't sure what the answer is, so I was like, please just do it consistently. Um, and, and, and Dixie reminds me right here, I follow the rule of where you only capitalize after a colon if it's a full sentence. So at least she's consistent in her style. Um, uh, repetition is another thing that a good editor will look for. Um, uh, there was, uh, uh, um, when an explorer returns with such an item, our scholars have to work dismantling such objects. Um, so there's too much such there, so she changed it to the. Um, again, when you're thinking about how does this role work and how does this flow together and whatnot, sometimes those small details can slip by you as a developer. Um, and the capitalization change for the worth cats and dogs. Um, uh, and this is actually a, a good point about the, the we're now building a style. Um, in Pugmire, I referenced the monarchies of Mal, but only a couple of times. So I hadn't quite landed on what the standard capitalization is. Obviously the monarchies of Mal book it's going to be referenced a lot, so we have to come to a decision on that. Um, and so this is a point where or Dixie looked at how the material had written thus far and then deduces a style from it. Um, and the style being deduced here is that if you're re referencing the monarchies in general sense, i.e. there are six different monarchies that have collaborated together, then it's lowercase. We're talking about these six city-state entities that coexist. Um, if you're talking about the entire group, uh, by its formal title. Its formal title is Monarchies of Mound that is capitalized. Uh, that was something that I kind of was doing subconsciously as I was working in the book, um, but Dixie deduced that, figured out retroactively, reverse engineered, as it were, an actual style out of it and came up with, okay, this is now the style going forward, which is an immensely, immensely hunt for skill. 
Um, also, um, because this is an in-world document, at the bottom uh, I had parentheses signatures to be added um, because it was meant to be a lengthy proclamation and that was going to be sent to the heads of the different dynasts, the different houses, uh, so they could sign it to sign on board with it. Um, and so the signatures to be added thing was an in-world thing, but so Dixie Lindsay, I'm not sure if this is meant to be in-world or not. Um, she didn't think it was, but she wanted to make absolutely sure that it was being handled correctly. Um, so sometimes it's useful to be able to just say, okay, I think I know what's happening here, but I want to just triple check, make absolutely sure you're thinking about that. Um, so best case scenario, yep, that's absolutely what I agreed to. It was a, I can just delete that comment and move on. Nothing needs to change. Every once in a while, they'll say, oh, actually, you know what? You're right. I really didn't mean it that way. I can see why you saw it that way, so let's actually rework that. Um, I'm going to jump ahead now to the magic chapter because I want to show um, a fairly rules-heavy chapter. Um, some game companies do have what are called rules editors. Um, someone who actually isn't editing for copy, but is rather uh, editing to make sure that the rules are designed consistently and are applied consistently and formatted consistently. Um, we generally don't do those. We rely on the developers and on this path to actually handle that themselves. We're looking into maybe looking into something else for that down the road at some point. Um, it's something we're mulling over. Um, but right now, uh, so most of that is on the developer's plate. The Ideally, the editor should be at least passingly familiar with the game to be able to do some light rules editing on their own. Um, but really, it's more the, the rule is formatted correctly, not is the rule actually correct. The editors aren't really thinking about that. So um, at this stage, if the game mechanics are not working correctly or not written correctly, um, the editor is going to make your bad rule as clear as possible, but they're not going to actually make the rule, improve the rule in any meaningful way. Um, again, some editors who might be very familiar with games might offer suggestions, but really at, for our process at this stage, rule design is done. But it is still useful to kind of show you what a rules-heavy edit might look like. Um, and actually, this is a, a good unrelated point. Um, one of the reasons, uh, one of the many, many reasons why I love working with Dixie is that she is an obsessive Googler, um, which sounds bad when you say it that way. But my, my point is, is that she does do a lot of research when she is editing. She wants to make sure that references are accurate and up to date. Um, so for a game like Monarchies of Mal, it's less research you need to do, but sometimes if there's an unusual word that comes up, she wants to make sure it's being used correctly. Um, and so uh, Kikoronite, comes up here and she's like, I don't know what this means, what it's supposed to be. Kokorina is actually a uh, monster that comes in the book. Um, but this brings up a very valid point. She saw a word she didn't recognize, could not find an answer for it, and assumed it was a mistake. Um, so we're referencing a monster that is not yet been discussed in the book. Uh, sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's useful to be able to kind of leave seeds of information that people can go, I wonder what that's about. And then later in the book goes, oh, I see what that's about now. But if it's written in a way that it looks like it's an error, then that's a problem. And so having someone who's coming in, again, with a fresh pair of eyes who doesn't know what a Kikoronite is and goes, oh, this is weird. What's it supposed to be? Then I was able to kind of rewrite that. And I think it just struck the word, um, frankly, because it was, it, it was not a point where it was telling me more about the world. It was looked like it was just a buried piece of information. Um, so there is a, a sweet spot to making sure that you find those correctly and accurately um and it comes with time it comes with a little bit of instinct a little bit of of, of skill um but if your editor is saying i don't know what this means um it's probably a case where you need to rework or rethink what that reference is doing um so yeah this is going to be a bunch of spells um don't think that it's uh, okay so example this is a case of the um numerical change um, people are talking about this at surprising length in the, in the chat, um, but Onyx Path is we spell out uh, numerals up to 10, and then we use numerals after it, um, with the exception of if the numeral is a game mechanic explicitly. Um, so uh, a good example of this is um, uh, five feet is spelled out because it's a unit of measurement. It's not a game mechanic in the way we're thinking about it. It's... it's, it's it's just quantifying a, a known unit of measure. Um, but for die eight, those are used as numerals because we're talking about a number of dice and a type of dice. Um, so that's where one of the things, the style nuance comes in. It's very important to understand the difference. 
Um, and writers aren't always going to understand the nuance of those things. They're just going to plop down numbers as it makes sense to them. Uh, I believe there's another one in here. Um, another point on terminology is uh, um, some of the, a lot of these spells were uh, reworked from uh, the um, uh, game design document. Basically, OGL games have uh, a, a system design uh, document um, where these are all the material that they put into the open game license that other people can use and reference. Um, and so a lot of these spells are spells that are available to the open game license that have been reworked for, for Monarchies of Mao. Um, and they're usually heavily rewritten, but sometimes you get into kind of the, the mode of, of just thinking about spells and you're code switching between Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition and what Monarchies of Mountain needs to do, and sometimes words slip by. And so in this case, she mentions uh, we're talking about an unseen target. Um, it was meant to be a target you cannot see, um, which is the usual definition of unseen. However, Monarchies of Mal has an entire group of demons called capital U Unseen. Um, and so if you had an unseen target, can be mean either is the target invisible or is the target a demon? Those are two very different things. Um, and so she wasn't sure what the intent was there, and so I had that you clarify that. And, and again, I think I changed it to invisible targets to, make, to clarify that point. So that's another thing is, like, um, is, is it, again, a tricky balance. I talked earlier about um, if the editor has a very familiar with the game, it can be helpful. But sometimes if they're too familiar, they may also see through the same things you're seeing through. So sometimes it's useful to have an a, a editor who's not completely familiar with it because they're going to find those things and go, did you mean this? Did you mean that? Because they're coming into it relatively fresh. So uh, again, it, it, it's project by project. Um, usually with the core book, it's a, it's a moot point um, because it's a brand new game anyway. Um, this is something that I have always struggled with. Um, again, uh, I've been writing for professionally for almost 20 years. I still screw up less and fewer. Uh, and I'm not proud of that. But the re uh, this is something that um, what I like to call writing ticks. Um, every writer I know of has some kind of tick, either some sentence structure they rely heavily on, some punctuation they rely heavily on, something they just can't wrap their head around. Um, for a long time, I just still do it. But my, one of my ticks is that I'll start a sentence with so, comma, um, it, you know, blah, 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 point. So, blah, 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 point. And I don't, I, I'm trying to work my way out of that, but it's something that I come to recognize. And so if you see a lot of sentences that start with so, comma, odds are I probably wrote that section. It's one of my writing ticks. Um, other writers have ticks like heavy reliance on m dashes, um, a heavy reliance on semicolons, long sentences with semicolons together. Um, none of these are incorrect. Well, some writer ticks are incorrect, but you can have a right tick that's not grammatically correct, that still works in a style, but it is excessive, and sometimes you need to resolve it. In this case, the less and fewer thing is a straight up error, and it's a pet peeve of Dixie, so she always catches it, and I keep saying, oh yeah, I won't, I'll, I won't do that in the future, and then I We'll do it in the future. And she gets to have another pet peeve again. So, uh, so and then again, even in my speaking, I will use so. Uh, so <laughs> it, is a, it is even also a verbal tick. But, and, and to be fair, a lot of people write like they talk. It's not uncommon. And, and if I know people well enough, sometimes I can actually figure out who wrote a section of a book because I know they're writing ticks and I know how they speak. Um, I, I can sometimes tell a Matthew Dawkins section, particularly if he's given a light hand, so developer hands. Um, uh, I can start to tell. I know Rose's sections pretty well. Um, so, uh, especially if I develop them a lot, I can start to tell a writer just by the way they write. Again, none of it's technically accurate. But as a developer, sometimes you want some of that voice. Sometimes you want that flavor and that, that gusto and that, that vibe going. Um, other times you want to homogenize it um, to make sure there's a consistent style. And again, it could be tricky with uh, a new core rule book. It's the first game of the line. You may not be entirely sure what the homogenous style looks like. Um, Onyx Path kind of has a default style that it's hard to describe. It's one of those, you know, when you see it, um, we generally talk in third person plural, for example. Um, it's lots of, you know, uh, we recommend you use blah kind of thing. Uh, although it very rarely refers to itself. Um, so it generally tries to go for neutral terms, but when it does refer to the team as an entity, it refers to them as we. Um, 
generally does a lot of second person when talking about rules. You will roll this dice. You will roll that die. Um, so these are all things that aren't really written down anywhere, but if you've read enough books, you have to recognize it. And the developer needs to kind of, yeah, we'll have to internalize that style if it's an outside style that's being imposed on them, or if it's a new game, they have to figure out what their style is going to be. And you can break it creatively. Um, uh, for the first Pugmire book, for example, a, a, tile shi a style shift uh, was that because it was largely written by me, um, I did use a lot of first-person references. I believe this is the best way to do that. Um, I put a lot more Eddie Webb into that book explicitly, which is something I did not do and have not done before then. I don't really do it at all. Um, I'm generally working with a team. Uh, so Eddie Webb is not a voice that's really welcome. You want to have the whole team's voice there. Um, for Monica's Mount, because I did not write all of the book, um, there was a big question of, do we still use I? Um, and ultimately, I felt that it was... It was morally awkward um, because it, it wasn't me writing it and I don't want to claim credit for somebody else's work. Uh, it's work for hire and there's a certain amount of that going on but at the same time I don't want I, I don't feel comfortable saying that's my work. I'm comfortable saying I own that work. I'm not comfortable saying I wrote that when I didn't. Um, so we switched to the default kind of we and I'm really just kind of pulled back on here but you see the example that here will discuss the ancient world, the cats and their views on their species and their enemies, will expand on the, the history touched on in chapter one and delve more deeply into cat culture. Lastly, we'll take you on a tour of the monarchies themselves. That's the usual style when we're doing those kinds of references. Um, in Pugmire, that would have been, I'll tell you about this. So uh, uh, style is not always set in stone either, but usually by the time the first book's out, there's a certain amount of cadence that goes after it. Um, Dystopia Rising, for example, um, uh, it definitely has a, a I wanted a, a grittier tone. Um, and so small things like, uh, I don't, I tried to avoid to use the word combat and well, instead replaced it with violence because I felt like the game's not about formal rules of, of etiquettes and fighting and armies and, and organized structure. No, he's just trying to keep that zombie from biting your leg off and so you're hitting it with whatever's available to you. I wanted that grungier feel and so by changing the tone of violence, that was important. Um, another style example is for uh, Vampire the Masquerade 20th Anniversary Edition. Um, we had started to decapitalize some words for Requiem, like clan and prince, um, because we wanted to normalize the words more. It's like we, vampires games that we have made in this style have been around for quite a long time, so we didn't need to have capitalized words. However, Vampire the Masquerade is a little more pretentious as an aesthetic than Vampire the Requiem, which is much more street level and gritty. Um, and so uh, the random capitalized words thing helps to get that ornate pretension across. Um, so these are these are actual discussions that happen when you're first developing a game. And these are all things that ideally the editor needs to know about so they can edit in that direction. So they don't realize that these things are, are mistakes or errors. Um, minor thing, we don't do uh, superscripts or subscripts um, just because they screw up with layout, so we don't do them. Uh, same with um, uh, a big problem I see with a lot of new writers is uh, when I'm working in Word, uh, Word very helpfully will make a bullet list if you put a bullet down. Um, and we can't use bullet lists. We have to manually put the bullet character in with a tab after it, um, which is a huge hassle every time, and I know it sucks, but usually writers, 50% of the time will forget it, which means it's on me to make sure I do it. And if I don't do it, then the editor's got to go through and make sure I do it. Someone's got to do it, um, because otherwise layout person has to do it. You don't want the layout person to do it. We're usually just kick it back and say, hey, this is wrong. Um, again, you, want, you don't want the layout person writing text, if at all possible. Uh, so I pulled this chapter out. Um, another example of capitalizing after a colon. Uh, there's another reason why I pulled this chapter out, and I do not remember what it was. Uh, here we go, yes. Um, uh, this is a, actually a good example of um, logic editing. Uh, so again, when you're, when you're developing uh, a tabletop RPG in particular, um, and especially with a core rule book, a lot of times you have a team of four to 12 writers um, and they're all working in small pieces that you have to cobble together. Um, for smaller projects, I can usually just assign a writer a chapter. And so it's pretty clear. Chapter one is 
blah, chapter two is blah, chapter three is blah, and then just put them in and make sure they all work together. Um, more often than what's happening is I'm having a chapter written by two or three people, and so they're all writing distinct chunks, and I have to put them all together into a document. Um, and one of the downsides of that process is that no matter how many times you read through, um, because it's all coming in in different ways and you're having to think about how all pieces fit together. Sometimes you're not following the order of how pieces are coming in. And so when someone else is reading it fresh, they're going, hey, you didn't, you referenced this thing, but you never talked about it before. Um, and so this is a case where um, I had uh, the Smilodon, um, which is the secret seventh house of Monarchy Zemao. Uh, they disappeared under mysterious circumstances and they're actually one of the, the background villains of the game. Uh, and so this is a chapter where we're doing a sto story about kind of how Smalodon works and at which point they disappear and stop being a house is muddy for the characters. Um, the idea is that the characters don't reference it. Once Smilodon fell and became possessed by demons, eh, spoiler, I guess, um, once that happens, the cats chose to eradicate all reference to them. So the in-character history for it is money. But what's happening here in this section is we're telling the story guide, here's actually what happened. And so that muddiness bled into the section where we do not want to have muddy. We want to have a really clear sense of exactly when Smilodon did things. Um, so Dixie points out that... Um, these are things that are happening, which earlier on we established the Smilodon house has already been destroyed, but now it seems they're making overt political gestures, which doesn't work because that only really works if they're still an openly recognized monarchy. Um, so, uh, la so later on she sees, oh, okay, Smilodon had been eradicated by this point, and so she's like, um, a note about how after Smilodon expedition went missing before they were found out. Um, so it's like, there's a clear these couple of sections up and the whole thing flows together. And sometimes that's the answer. Sometimes these, these changes are actually really straightforward. Um, or not straightforward, but they're very simple. You just change a few words in a few sections and everything else kind of clicks into place. Um, it's great when that works. Sometimes the editor's going to have much stronger opinions and say, no, this whole section needs to be worked or it's not working correctly. Um, here's another example of how monarchies was used inconsistently, and so lots of monarch, monarchies, 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 um, because we established that style early on. Um, this is an interesting point. Um, sometimes you'll run into situations that aren't inaccurate, and spell check doesn't notice them, but because of the, the style of the company you're working with, they might be seen as wrong. Um, worshipped can be used with one P. Uh, but it depends on, frankly, it, it's, 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 it's kind of arbitrary. It depends on which region of the, of the, of the world you're coming from. Um, sometimes even in the U.S. it's used slightly different ways. Sometimes in different publishers spell it different ways. Um, I just, frankly, I got this wrong here. And so it's like we use two Ps here. Great. Let me go ahead and, and accept that change and move on. But that's not an error necessarily it, it, it's not even an error against the style guide because i don't think we've actually established that but it's just, that's the, the two pieces that we generally use <laughs> uh, nixie points and comments that she's actually moving back to one p now that was when she was in her two p period so again this stuff changes and sometimes it's, it, it's idiosyncratic sometimes it's uh, a personal choice um so superscript subscripts uh, i think that was it for all this one let me double check um, oh, here's another example. Um, this is a case where uh, I actually reject the change. Um, and this is a good example. Um, I mentioned last episode that in Monarchies of Mao, naming conventions were actually a pretty important thing we needed to nail down. Um, with with Pugmire, it's straightforward. It's like, it's your dog's name, and their surname is their dog breed, tweaked slightly to fit with the naming convention, as long, turning the dog breed into a surname. But otherwise, it's just, you are dog breed. That's your name. Um, because the houses are a separate layer, um, we needed to actually establish how naming conventions work because this is, to a certain degree, an honor society. And so you're proclaiming your political affiliation every time you introduce yourself. Uh, and there's, so there's slightly formal name structures. And we, I decided way back even before I uh, finished Pugmire that uh, cats used a Vaughn name as to, to, to 
to delineate their house affiliation. So if you're part of House Rex, you are Von Rex. If you're part of House Angora, you are Von Angora. Um, however, the six houses are also cat breeds. And so the cat surname is usually their breed, although they're much more flexible about that because cats are generally, we don't really think about their breeds as often. Um, this is sometimes cats don't even have a surname, and that's fine. Because really, as long as they have house affiliation, the surname is kind of secondary. But particularly nobles, um, when their family founded that monarchy, they're going to want to reflect that. Um, and so we have a case where the dynast for house or for the monarchies of Rex is actually uh, of family Rex, and is very proud of that fact, and is kind of trying too hard. Um, so, like you see, the uh, dynast of uh, other dynasts are. Uh, Briku von Simrick, uh, Kier von Koren, Threnody von Mao. Um, and these are all established older monarchies. Rex is kind of a contentious monarchy. The other ones kind of look down on Rex. And so I wanted to reflect that this is um, the dynasty is trying a bit too hard to grab at respectability. Um, so she was like, is it supposed to be Rex von Rex? And the answer was yes, it is supposed to be that. Um, so what looks like it's a one-word discussion, there's actually a lot going on. Um, and sometimes as a developer, I can spend five minutes justifying the placement of a word. Um, Rich Thomas, I drove him bonkers when uh, I would argue why serial commas were important for V20 when he was laying it out. Um, we got into lengthy discussions about the validity of the serial comma um, to the point where now I have strongly advocate its use in uh, the Onyx Pass style guide. Um, and I'm not going to have the serial comma debates on this podcast, or I'm sorry, on this uh, video, but the point is there are times where a lot of thought goes into word placement and word choice. Most of the time that's not the case, and most of the editors correct and notice it's weird. Every once in a while it's like, no, actually I did intend it this way. Um, luckily Dixie is in the chat backing up my serial comma validation because it's inherently correct. Um... Minor point, um, maps and stuff on, uh, uh, this is unrelated to editing, but um, since both Pugmire and Monarchies of Mao were games where maps became important, um, I started developing uh, the aspect of taking a picture or a snapshot or something of the map that we're going to get commissioned and pointing it at the rough place in the book so that layout knows map goes here, but also so the editor reading the text knows, okay, here's how these things relate to make sure the text is actually no pun intended, mapping to the, the graphic we have here. Um, so it's, it's useful for them to have the context. And so by putting in there, the editor actually gets to see, oh, okay, here's how these different countries relate. So when the text says, Mao is to the west of Angora, the editor goes, okay, that is correct. As opposed to otherwise, they would be like, I don't know if that's correct, so I guess so. Um, but this gives them something to actually check against to make sure the text is actually accurate. That's something you do all the time, but maps in particular can be very helpful. Um, in the chat, someone was asking about 100 versus 100. Apparently, it's it's numerical. Uh, so there you go. I uh, believe that's everything here. Again, love nice comments. Um, that uh, I'm naming the char a character uh, Lady Pixel, and apparently Dixie had a cat named Pixel. So it's like, oh, cool. That was intentional, but neat little thing. Um, so we got a couple more chapters left. Let me skim through these. This is another, uh, this is the uh, monster section. Uh, it's called Enemies. Um, and this is another kind of rules heavy section. And a lot of this was um, just trying to make sure the, the, the template was correct. Uh, um, I don't believe this. He was actually checking my math on this stuff because he assumed that I was doing that math correctly. Um, so more it's just, is this template working? And also are, is the actual pros and rules clear? Um, this is one of my favorite typos. Um, I, I, I have uh, badgers damming rivers as in building dams on rivers. Um, I inadvertently used uh, D-A-M-N. Um, and I was like, damn you, river, give me water. Um, so sometimes you can get really funny typos um, and just embracing that and realizing, yep, that was an embarrassingly bad typo and moving on is, is helpful. Um, yeah, little things here, like uh, there's a lot of copy paste because certain uh, creatures, if they were higher difficulty levels uh, they would have the, the powers of the previous version as well as new powers um and so i copied paste them sometimes i forgot to update uh checking those um like okay the edge referencing the thing we're talking about here as opposed to the previous thing um uh, so like for example um the badger slasher has the vicious power 
um, the Badger Head Splitter has the exact same power, but it should refer to the Badger Head Splitter, not the Badger Slasher. So little things like that. It's useful to catch, catch up. Um, speaking of copy and paste, um, it is ideally you don't want to do a lot of it. Um, obviously, because people don't want to feel like they're reading the same thing over and over and over again. But sometimes it's unavoidable. If you're going to address the exact same topic again, and if it doesn't make sense to do a page access reference, it sometimes is just easier to copy and paste the same material in again. Um, so it's something that I, I try to avoid doing, but in this case, it's the my options were see previous monster, which means you're constantly flipping through multiple monsters, or just have all the rules in one easy place. So I felt like the ease of access was more important than um, concision and saving a few extra words. And frankly, it's only one sentence in a lot of these cases, so it's like you're not you're not saving enough space to to validate it. Um, so I do occasionally copy and paste, particularly if it makes sense. Um, Dixie uh, uh, loved slash hated the uh, illuminated bun sun. Uh, Called laboratory reference. Um, this is a game about puns, so it's again, it's like if you're not gonna like puns, may have to get into edit, but like, in the case, it's the best kind of grown because it is a, a good bad pun. Um, and this was the Kokor and I talked about earlier, and I was like, oh, that was the thing I was looking for. Um, but again, it's the now I understand that, but also maybe go double check that to make sure that other people don't have to make that observation several chapters later. Uh, I think that's everything for this chapter. A lot of bolding where things need to be bolded correctly. Um, particularly, I think it was the, the, the I, I, I didn't bold the uh, colon after these. Um, now this is one point where, uh, this interesting debate. Uh, Pugmire, Monarchy, and Mal were both inspired by uh, classic Dungeons & Dragons, particularly the kind of AD&D era of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and so sometimes when I was designing this, I would make decisions that made total sense to my brain of things that happened in the 80s. And so therefore everyone obviously knows these things. Um, so it's helpful to have someone who's not obviously steeped in the esoteric of how rules are presented in 1918, 1981 to say, huh? And in this case, uh, as a good example of it, is because I had an M dash for intelligence because it was an unintelligent creature. Um, it had a score of zero. Uh, and she pointed like, should it be null or should it be minus six? Um, but she's like, if it's null, she'll probably put NA because we have lots of minuses in here. Um, whereas I am used to the standard that TSR did of just putting an N dash for null. But it's a good point. It's like, not everyone's going to recognize my antecedents and my references here. So let's go for clarity over my extremely subtle drop to the monster manual. Um, so, again, it's, it's a good point to have someone who's not in your head looking at that going, is this what you meant? I think that is everything. Yep, okay. So, one last chapter. Uh, this is the adventure. Um, uh, where Dixie references the Rat King one last time. Um, yeah, it was a running joke. But it, 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 made, you know, it, made, it made the game a little easier. Um, or the, the editing process a little easier. Uh, but this is, a, I think, a finally a good example because adventures are an interesting intersection of flavor text and rules text and stat blocks. Um, all the things that we talked about kind of in isolation in the previous chapters, all of those styles are now blending and blurring together inside the adventure structure. Uh, on top of that, this is the core rule book. Um, usually this is the place where we decide what the adventure structure is going to look like. Um, now, because I wanted to emulate Pugmire, I already had the Pugmire adventure structure, so that was one less piece we didn't have to worry about. Um, but uh, uh, Dixie is still looking at this, going, okay, are, are all the, is this all making sense? This is all flowing. Um, is a person reading this getting the information they need at the time they need it and in a clear way, and can they easily reference it later? Uh, those are things that I'm trying to do as a developer, but having an editor coming through make sure, did I achieve those goals, is really, really helpful. Um, so the first half, we go through the characters here. Then we have a synopsis. Um, and this is mostly just clearing up based on uh, whether Trailblazers is capitalized or not. Um, it was a group. Uh, Toronto Trail Trailblazers is a group that player characters can join. Um, but when we were just referring to them in the general sense of player characters, uh, Trailblazers is lowercase. That was something that was kind of decided, I think, during this process. Um, 
in this little case, like a, a sentence, a phrase, has a bright smile on her face that gives her eyes a wide berth. And she's like, are you trying to say that smile doesn't meet your, meet your eyes? Is that what this means? Um, and I, I see what the style is going for here. Um, but if it's not clear, because this is a game where eyes can be in other parts of the head. Uh, so sometimes using colorful language can actually be confusing in certain kinds of game settings. Uh, so um, like, for example, if you're playing in a, a game with, with magic users and saying, you know, she walked into the room and set the room on fire, that can mean two very different things <laughs> based on what you're talking about. Everyone was very excited by the, her social contributions to the room or whether she's literally roasting them. So sometimes those euphemisms, it's going to have someone double check and go, is this what, you, what you're going for here? Um, this is a, a, a bigger section. It's not a huge edit, but it's a good kind of contextual thing is that I had uh, kind of a if-then statement functionally, which is if the Trailblazers did this, read this. If the Trailblazers did that, read that. Um, in this case, they both read this and there wasn't any this or that. Um, they both kind of read the exact same way. So I had to kind of clarify it's much more either or, not it could be plot like you're reading both of them, but which didn't make any uh, sense in the flow. Uh, Seeing here's another map um, using for reference, again, to kind of help uh, everyone involved uh, understand what the context is. Um, uh, uh, this is a, a good point, is um, Pugmire very early on developed the uh, style idea that uh, any reference to hands is replaced with paws. Um, it's an obvious choice at the time that has led to some very bizarre discussions. Uh, so, like, when you hand something to someone, uh, do you paw it to them? And ultimately the answer is use the verb give instead to avoid the problem. Um, and then it's like, okay, so do you, what about handling situations? Well, in that case, handle is fine because it's a verb on its own, even though the handle, I believe, etymologically is still derived from or has a connection to hand. Um, but this case where we have stable hands, and it's like, are they stable paws? <laughs> and the answer is no, they're not stable paws. I think I just changed them to stable workers. Um, but it's a case of like, hand, hand to paw is something you can't easily just do a finder place for. Because there's lots of cases where hand means something different, um, uh, or hand can have a different connotation, and paw is not always the best replacement. Uh, so it's one of those things that's singularly simple and a nice little flavorful way to get people to realize, oh, we're playing dogs to the people that has had a bizarre amount of very nitpicky consequences that are always kind of a hassle to extract during editing and development. Uh, skin by another map there, for um, crawl. Um, this case where I just a word dropped out. Uh, her audience is twenty to thirty rats, and in the in the main, non-aggressive. Um, and what's meant is, what's what's being intended here is, and are generally non-aggressive. Uh, but the and is missing, uh, and also and in the main is an uncommon phrase. Uh, so it made more sense to kind of just rewrite that entirely. And something else is. Uh, uh, Colloquialisms can be a tricky thing for tabletop role playing games. Uh, phrases or, or sentences or ways of, of communicating things that seem normal and common to you because you grow up in a certain part of the world may actually be strange and, and opaque to people who aren't from that part of the world. Um, and particularly as Onyx Path sells games globally, even though only in English, but still. Uh, different parts of the world use English differently. And uh, even you know, again, America is not a homogenous English language. We have our own kind of, of idioms and the like. Um, so having uh, Andrew can have Kevin uh, ear for that, as it were, and go, this might be a bit opaque or unusual or might be interfering with what you're trying to say here. Using some colloquialisms makes sense, particularly for invoice material, also a character speaking or a character's writing, and we're reading what the character wrote. Um, so some of that's actually valuable to kind of establish where a character comes from. Um, one of my favorite crutches is whatever many Irish characters that try to use feck, F-E-C-K, as opposed to the alternative. Um, it's a very uniquely Irish profanity. Um, uh, but even uh, Eng American English 
is different in the Midwest, in the Rust Belt, in the South, in the, in the West Coast, in the East Coast. These all have slightly different takes on English. And so even though we're writing in American English default, even that's not 100% accurate. Um, so sometimes we generally, if the colloquialism makes sense and it's clear in the context, we just don't bother with it. But sometimes using colloquialism can actually cause the text to become confusing if you're not familiar with the idiom. So that's some things we have to kind of think about. Uh, but that is pretty much uh, everything, I think, about for uh, editing. Um, these are the kinds of things that uh, an editor has to look at, and then we, I as a developer have to go look through and revise and think about whether this is where we need to go or not. Um, so let me check through uh, the chat here. I think uh, all we really have here are some people uh, agreeing with my serial comma support. So that, that's that's pretty uh, important and I appreciate that. Um, so if you have any other questions, uh, I have time for one or two more. Um, but uh, if not, um, I will say that this is uh, probably my second to last episode. Um, after this, we will go into uh, the various other stages after this. Um, a lot of developer work uh, after this stage, uh, I approve the edits, it goes to layout, and then um, we're looking at proofing, which I've already done. That was the very first episode I did was proofing. Um, so really we're looking at uh, approvals, um, other kinds of nitpicky things. So I'll probably go over a grab bag of other stuff, um, but also I'm gonna do a Q&A uh, through. So if you have questions about the development process I haven't covered in the other videos or you want to always been curious about, uh, let me know over the next couple of weeks. I'll also do a shout out on Twitter about it um, and I'll try to answer those. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, next one's gonna be the last one, kind of a grab bag episode. And then we'll see how things go. Um, it seems like people have been enjoying these. Uh, so once I talk through all the topics, um, I kind of call it there, uh, let it go for a while. And then if there's enough topics that kind of build up over time where if I could do another four or five of these, I might do another s series of them. Um, but mainly my goal was to really kind of showcase step by step every thing that a developer kind of goes through. So it's, it's such a weird, unusual thing. And so kind of talking everyone through spending a few hours, like this is what you do here, this is what you do here. Um, for people who become Honest Path developers, hopefully they can use these videos as a reference for how do I do red lines? Like go to the red line video and look at that. If they don't understand what the editorial process or their place in it, they can go through this one and see what's going on. That was kind of my primary goal, but there may be other things that seem perfectly natural to me that other people might be confused about. So. Ne the next and two weeks from now, that, that next episode is going to be to kind of go into all those if you have any more questions. Uh, but if there's nothing else in the chat, um, thank you guys for hanging out. Appreciate it. I will see you in two weeks.